Welcome back. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming right back in. Thank you for coming right back in. For those of you who are coming in for the first time, this is part two of Daring Dialogues. I'm your host, Shante Charles, and we're going to jump right into our next segment, which is Tools of Titans, the tactics, routines, and habits of billionaires, icons, and world-class performers. So if you see my little key up there in my description and my crown and my world, uh, that is what that is a reflection of, that we want to, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as those who are considering maybe launching your business, maybe you're not there yet, um, these are going to be some helpful things that we share out of this book. I do recommend that you get this book. It is divided into three sections, Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, and we are on the Wealthy section. Um, but season two, we're probably going to go back to the health section um, and get some inspiration for keeping our fitness life in our health life together. All right. So today we are hearing first from Chris Young. Chris Young, you can find him on Twitter at Chef Chris Young, C-H-R-I-S Young, or you can go to his website, which is ChefSteps.com. He is an obsessive tinkerer, inventor, and innovator. His areas of expertise range from extreme aviation to mathematics to barbecues. Above all, uh, Tim Ferriss calls him one of the clearest thinkers he knows. He is the principal co-author of the genre-redefining six-volume work called Modernist Cuisine. He's also the founding chef of Heston Blumenthal's Fat Duck Experimental Chicken Experimental Kitchen, excuse me, the secret culinary laboratory behind dishes at one of the best restaurants in the world. He uh, completed degrees in theoretical mathematics and biochemistry. He is now the CEO of Chef Steps based in Seattle, Washington. And so this is a, a world-class, world-renowned chef. For those of you who are into uh, the culinary arts, you might want to check him out. So what can, we, <clears throat> what can we learn from Chris Young today? One of the tips that he gives to entrepreneurs that I found uh, very interesting and I agree with somewhat, he says, the interesting jobs are the ones that you make up. The interesting jobs are the ones that you make up. His dad was a very successful entrepreneur and he gave Chris this advice when he was a freshman in high school. He said, don't worry about what kind of job you're going to do because the job you're going to do probably hasn't even been invented yet. The interesting jobs are the ones you make up. And he said that's something that he hopes to instill in his own son um, to do things that you're interested in. And if you do them really well, you're going to find a way to parry that interest into a good business opportunity. Um, if you look at the job market and the job sector, um, most of the people that we know, um, Bill Gates, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and I forget the other gentlemen, are already starting to talk about the fact that jobs are disappearing. Mm -hmm. Jobs are disappearing. And they're talking about the fact that they're mainly disappearing because of the way that technology is going. Technology is taking out a lot of the lower level and basic jobs that people would have gotten right out of high school, right? People who said, you know, I don't want to go for a four-year college degree or, you know, I maybe just want to do high school, maybe two years of technical school and then go right into the workforce. A lot of those jobs are being... Uh, how can I put, how can I put it outsourced to computers to robots so what they're saying is we have to be prepared for people who are not going to have the jobs that our uh, forefathers once had and we have to have a plan in place that what are we going to do with these jobless people what are we going to do when we can't supply, when there's not enough jobs to go around 
for the amount of people who are going to need them. Okay, that is a very real problem that businesses and business people who are forward thinkers are already looking to solve right now. They're already looking to solve it. Um, we look at what happened with the coal industry, right? People are talking about um, our president's idea to bring back the coal industry. Well, the reality is the coal industry is not going to come back the way in which it was in the past. And to tell that to those people is to give them a false hope okay is to give them a false hope why isn't it going to come back because the types of energy being used is what is driving them out of a job okay more clean energy sources more renewable energy sources are being used okay <laughs> so why not if you're going to invest in areas like West Virginia or the Rust Belt, as they call it, which is, you know, upper central part of America. If you're going to invest money, why not invest money in education? Why not invest money in those places to re-educate people who need a new job skill because the job skill that they already have is going to make them obsolete and unable to provide for their families? So it doesn't make sense to give them a false hope that the coal industry is coming back when the reality is um, because we're using a different kind of energy, that's why your jobs are disappearing in the first place. Make sense? All right. So because of that, because of that, and if you were with me when I was reading MLK's work, all right, he began to talk about um, chaos or community. He began to talk about a plan and a part of MLK's plan that was proposed over 40 years, uh, over 50 years ago was a universal basic income. MLK saw this coming 50 years ago. He said, we have got to get people on a universal basic income because the way that technology is going, it is going to get to the place where very few people are actually going to need a job because take technology is going to be taking over a lot of the jobs that people do. And so it would be helpful to have a universal basic income. In other words, a income given to everyone that will provide their basic needs so that they're not working just for money. And he had this crazy wild concept that if you gave people a universal basic income, right? It would enable people to use their brain power to innovate, not just to go to a nine to five. So MLK was like much further ahead of his time um, in talking about that. And now Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, um, Mark Zuckerberg, those people are talking about some of the same concepts that what do you do when you have technologicalized the world to the point that work is going to mean something different. It's going to mean something different in the future because the jobs that humans were doing, now robotics will be doing. Okay, so they're thinking about that now. How are we going to um, provide income? And then they were talking about um, because robots are taking over so many of the jobs, why don't we tax businesses, right? Why don't we tax businesses per robotic instrument that they use to take over a human job and use that money that we're taxing them with because they're pulling jobs by replacing it with technology, use that monies to supply for people who don't have jobs. So they are, they are trying to come up with solutions to what is going to be occurring in the next 20, 30 years, okay? The other question he asked here is, <clears throat> the other question he said that his role model, the person that he looks up to asked him was, if you had $100 million, what would you build that would have no value to others in copying? I'm going to say that again. If you had $100 million, what would you build 
that would have no value to another person in copying? It's a really good question. Um, he said this. <clears throat> When Intel, the, the computer company, software company, Intel, goes to build a new chip fabricator, it costs billions and billions of dollars, and there's no value in anybody else trying to copy it. Because not only do they have to spend even more money to catch up, but they have to spend billions to learn everything else Intel knows about that chip. And then they have to be 10 times better for anyone else to want to use their product. So it's just a waste of everyone's time to attempt to copy what they're doing. I feel like preaching today. <laughs> Listen, he is in essence saying, what can you create and what can you produce in the earth that is so unique that nobody will try to copy it? Nobody will try to copy it. Nobody will try to have something similar to it. He says, start there. Start there on your bright idea. What is it that you're doing that is so unique that it's not copyable? Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of copying going on. There's a lot of copying going on. There's a lot of copycatting going on. There's a lot of hijacking of people's ideas and concepts going on. And you don't want to be in that realm at all as an entrepreneur, as a business person. You want to be so far ahead. You want to be in a different stratosphere that people will say, I see what they're doing and I'm not even going to try to copy that. I'm just going to let them be great. Right? I'm not even going to try to imitate it. So... I think that's, a, that's actually a good brainstorming idea. If you had $100 million to invest in something, what would you build that would have no value for other people to copy? Shondo. <laughs> Here's another uh, thing that he said for businesses and business owners, and I completely agree with this. He said, what is some advice that you would give to, um, <clears throat> to people in business? He said this, hold the standard. Somebody put that up there. Hold, hold the standard. What does that mean? Hold the standard. He says this. <clears throat> he said, when you're trying to sell something, you don't want to send something out. Thank you. You don't want to send something out into the world that is subpar, hoping that people don't notice that it's not that good. Don't try to slip by with something that you know is below standard. Hold the standard. And if you can't get a product out, if you can't get something out, don't send it out below standard. He said, ask for help. Take the time to fix it. Do whatever's necessary, but don't cheat. Hold the standard on your good, your service, and your product. I agree wholeheartedly. I try to tell people this. Um, and some people listen, some people don't. I try to tell people this, especially in the field that I work in, which is, um, publishing and writing. Okay. A lot of people come up with unrealistic deadlines for getting their books out. And I take a look at your work and I will tell you this work, this book needs X amount of work and you're probably going to need um, depending on how bad you write, because there are people who have great ideas, but they are poor writers, okay? Um, depending on your writing skill, sometimes it may take an editor maybe three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks to go in and edit your work, okay? And that also has to do with the volume of what you're putting out into the world. 
Obviously, I'm going to tell you right now. You see this was put out into the world? I can tell you right now, they took more than two weeks to edit this. Okay? So, you, we take a look at your work, we evaluate your work, and we give you a time frame as to how long it's going to take the editor to go through your work and make sure your work is excellent when you put it out into the world. All right? There are people who don't take their editor's advice. And they say, well, I'm going to use somebody who can get it out in the world faster than you can. And that's okay. That's okay. But the reality is, if you put it out into the world with lots of errors in it, you're going to wind up having to do double duty because you're going to have to recall that work and you're going to have to re-edit again and put out another edition rather than just doing it right the first time. All right? So I agree with this. He says, ask for help. Fix it. Take your time. Do whatever is necessary. Don't cheat. Don't set unrealistic deadlines for whatever you're putting out, whether it's a book, whether it's a, a recipe, whether you're an, an event planner and somebody is coming to you and saying, hey, I want to put together this event and this is the time frame that I have. And you're looking realistically as an event planner and you're saying, this is not a realistic time frame. There's things we have to order. There's people that's got to be in place. There's uh, catering companies and all these things that we have to make sure this is done in excellence. And that person still insists on doing it their way. At some point in business, you have to say, you know what? I'm going to have to refuse this client or I'm going to have to refuse this product because I care more about the integrity and the quality of what I'm putting out in the world as a business owner, I care more about that than securing another client. Okay? So hold the standard. Hold the standard for yourself. Hold the standard for your business. All right? Hold the standard for your business. We're going to the next person and then we'll be done. Exactly. I've had to turn down... I've had to turn down clients because they wanted me to rush something that I knew should not be rushed. It was good money, but I don't do what I do just for the money. <laughs> okay? And as an editor, my name is going to be on it. There's one, there's only one editing project that I regret that my name is on because after I did the work for that person, that person chose to ignore all of my editing and they published what they wanted to publish and they kept my name on their project. And to this day, if you go research that book, that book gets one star ratings. One star. Because they didn't listen to their editor. So I know from experience, it is not worth having your name on something that is raggedy. That actually pulls down the value of your own work, your, the, your, the value of your own company. So hold the standard, business owners, business leaders. Hold the standard. And if people don't want to meet your standard, then they can scroll on. Refer them to another company. But you have to hold the standard. At the end of the day, it's going to be your integrity on the line. At the end of the day, it's going to be your conscience that is going to be dealing with whether or not you put out something quality in the world. All right, last business owner. Hopefully, we'll be able to get through this. Yeah, we should very quickly. Uh, Damon John. Damon John. Now, some of you probably already know him. Um, his... His Twitter, Facebook, Instagram handle is the Shark Damon. D A Y M O N D. Damon John is the CEO and founder of Fubu for us by us, which Damon grew from his original, get this, forty dollar budget into a six billion dollar lifestyle brand. He is a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship, and he appears on ABC's Shark Tank. Damon is the recipient of more than 35 industry awards, including Brand Week's Marketer of the Year, Ernst & Young's New York Entrepreneur of the Year Award as well. He is the best-selling author of three books, including, and I think I'm actually going to find this book, it's called The Power of Broke. 
that might be my next business book to check out. So he gives these tips as far as businesses. All right. He says, if you go out there and you start making noise and making sales, people will find you. Sales are the cure all for advertisement. <laughs> You can talk about how great your business plan is and how well you're going to do. You can make up your own opinions, but you cannot make up your own facts. Ooh, Lord, somebody. Mm, that's a sermon. <laughs> you can make up your own opinions, but you cannot make up your own facts. Sales cure all. So if you want people to pay attention to your product, make sure you are selling. Five days a week, he says, I read my goals before I go to sleep and when I wake up. There are 10 goals that I have around health, family, business, etc. that have expiration dates and I update and review them every six months. All right. My parents always taught me, he said, that my day job would never make me rich. It would actually be my homework. Y'all get that? His day job, his nine to five would not make him rich. It would be his homework. In other words, it would be the things that he's doing in addition to. It would be the research and the study that he's doing in addition to. Mm -hmm. All right. He says what he asked the question, what is the best or most worthwhile investment you've made? He said, I invested, my best investment was when I took time to be a foot messenger while I was in high school. During this time, I got a chance to go around the entire city of Manhattan and I came across all different kinds of people. Some were extremely high profile. Others were extremely high entry level employees. Some were wealthy and some were poor. I had never had this sort of exposure in my life and it opened up my eyes to opportunity. He says, he asked a question, do you have any quotes that you live your life by or think about often? This is a very good quote. I've heard it before. And it says this, money is a great servant, but a horrible master. Somebody type that on the screen. Because some of us need to remember that. Money is a great servant, but a horrible master. And so if you are living your life um, where money is mastering you, if you are living your life to bow down to money, if you're living your life to worship money, as a lot of people are, it will be a horrible master to you. Money is a great servant. When you have money in its proper place and you're using it to serve people, you're using it to serve others, money is a great servant but it's a horrible master. It's a horrible thing to be under the control of money. That everything you do is based on money. Not people, but money. Um, and then lastly, he said, um, thank you for putting that up there. He says, um, what are some of the books that you would recommend that people read in business? And I ha actually have a couple of these. Uh, one of the books he recommends is Think and Grow, Think and Grow Rich. There's also um, a Think and Grow Rich for Black America. So I would actually recommend getting both of those. Um, he recommends Who Moved My Cheese, The Richest Man in Babylon, and Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. And um, Tim Ferriss also noted that that book, Genghis Khan and the making of the modern world has been recommended by several billionaires. All right. So those are some tools for us today. Remember, if you want to make, if you want to get people's attention, make sure that you are out there selling your product. Okay. Um, make sure you hold the standard. Don't go underneath your own standard for your work and what you do, because it will come back to bite you later. Um, <clears throat> make sure that you want to put something out into the world that not everybody is doing, that it's hard to copy, it's hard to imitate. And um, those are our tips 
our Tools of Titans for today. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. I believe I have two minutes left. <laughs> so um, we'll be back next week. Remember, we're rolling into our 100th episode. And um, on episode 100, I will have some giveaways. So make sure you tune in for that. So we're actually going to end season one this coming Wednesday, if the Lord wills. We'll be doing our 100th episode. Uh, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, make sure you tune in. Um, as we close out Daring Dialogues Season 1. I have been so encouraged and excited and empowered, and I hope that you all have too, um, by what we've been reading. We've been getting it in. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'm going to be uh, taking a summer hiatus. I'm going to be uh, working on my health. I'm going to be celebrating 17 years of marriage. So I may pop back in here and there, uh, over the summer, but it certainly won't be every single day. Um, but I do thank you all for your time and attention today. And I hope that you have a great and wonderful, fabulous Friday, fabulous weekend. We will be on, uh, Sunday at two, around two thirty PM, uh, for our Sunday broadcast. And, uh, I just hope that you all have a great weekend. Remember, stay safe, pay attention to your surroundings, be a blessing to someone else. Check out the entrepreneur that we talked about on um, part one, Antonio Neal, A-N-T-O-N-I-O Neal. Um, check out his Facebook page and see how you can be of a support to a business owner who uh, was robbed of his equipment uh, that he uses to provide uh, for his family through business. All right. Thank you all again for your time and attention. Take care and God bless.